A lot of entrepreneurs who realize they can run their business from anywhere in the world are saying, let me run my business in a place with low or zero taxes to keep more of my money to reinvest. And they ask, what's the best country to do that? Today, I'm gonna to tell you why you need to consider the three best countries. I've been telling you for years to avoid one size fits all and one step solutions. And so if you're looking to move your business overseas or start a brand new business overseas and you're thinking, what one country can I go, set up my business, live, and hire other people around me, and then eventually get citizenship, you're looking at it wrong. And I'm gonna go through some case studies of entrepreneurs that we've helped here at Nomad Capitalist, as well as give you the three different things you wanna look out for when you're trying to pull off this strategy. The end result is what you should focus on, and that is you're moving your business to low tax or zero tax jurisdiction. You're living in a place that you love, and if you want a second citizenship to protect yourself or to protect your ability to live where it is that you want, then you can work towards that as well. And again, that may be entirely different places. You can have one, two, or three different combinations thereof. It's what we help entrepreneurs do every day at Nomad Capitalist is build their suite of experts from the country they're leaving to the country they're going, the place they're living, the place they're banking, these things are often not gonna match up. The first case study was a gentleman who came to us. He wanted to live in Milan, he's a very fashionable guy. And we told him that Italy had a lump sum tax where he as a single guy can pay 100,000 euros per year and he can do that for well over a decade. And so he can have that tax advantage. Italy's tax regime with the lump sum is more flexible than other regimes in Europe such as Portugal's NHR system that you've heard a lot about. And so he was able to go and set up his company offshore in the UAE in one of the free zones. Well, he will be able to continue to pay 0% tax. So his company's paying 0% tax. He will pay a lump sum of 100,000 euros in tax. Now, if one year things just totally fall apart and his company goes from making millions to making you know 150,000 euros, uh, he can just basically go and say, hey, I'll just pay whatever the regular taxes are. Italy has other tax incentives. He will then lose that 100,000 euro lump sum, but you have a little bit of flexibility there in case your business just totally goes down. But for him, he's making several million dollars a year. He's basically paying, I think it was about three and a half or 4% in tax to Italy. It's more money than Italy is gonna get from him or from most of its other taxpayers. But at the company level in the UAE is paying nothing. Not every European country will allow you to live there under their simple tax regime and have a company in the UAE, but we were able to make that happen. Now, he is making millions a year and he didn't wanna wait 10 years to become naturalized as an Italian citizen. He wanted to secure his access to live in Europe, whether it's Italy or whether the tax exemption runs out. In many years, he wants to move somewhere else in Europe, whether he just changes his mind at some point. So as an American, he got Maltese citizenship. So he's going through the process of making a donation to Malta, getting citizenship in Malta, which will then allow him to live anywhere in the European Union. So the stopgap there was getting a self-sufficient residence permit in Italy. He's not really making much of an investment that will serve him for 15 to 18 months while Malta's process is ongoing. And then once he has that Malta citizenship, he simply lives in Malta as an EU citizen. And so that is his process. He lives in one place. He's a citizen in an entirely different place because he wanted to speed up the process and his company is in an entirely different place. Three things, but he's getting his goal of living in fashionable Milan with a great tax system, his company's somewhere else, his employees are someone else. Here's a second case study. Had someone, we worked with them, they weren't sure where they wanted to live, but they also liked the idea of Southern Europe, a bit more laid back, nice weather, lower cost of living. A lot of people from the US, Canada, all over the world are moving to Southern Europe right now because countries like Portugal have flexible tax regimes. I have told you, if you are making 2 million euros or more per year, there's probably a better tax regime out there for you than Portugal's NHR. Doesn't mean you should always optimize to the extreme for taxes. If you wanna live in Portugal and it costs a bit more, live in Portugal, it'll still be very tax friendly for many people, but Portugal is more restrictive. So we had this entrepreneur and he and his young family, like they did in Southern Europe, we ultimately settled on Porto, Portugal. He liked the connectivity, he liked the smaller vibes. So they found that for lifestyle. However, because they're in Portugal, we could not go and set up a company in the UAE. And so we had a bit more of a complication where we have to use in Portugal what are called whitelist jurisdiction companies. You can't go to the UAE, you can't go to Hong Kong, you can't go to the Cayman Islands or any of these other totally tax-free places. So we had to set up a multi-company structure in Europe where there's an operating company, there's a company on top of that, you know, he has employees in different places, we had to do proper, you know, tax memoranda. So he really, you know, preferred Portugal because his thing was, you know, I'm just getting started 
I think he was making you know close to a million dollars a year. He's going to pay you know somewhere though in the mid five figures in taxes. Ultimately, he wants to get out of the U.S. because they are going to take a little bit of an extra piece above what he's already paying in Europe. But he likes the fact that hey, you know what? I don't have to spend any money to get citizenship. I don't have any claim through ancestry, but I'd like to have the ability as well as the first gentleman to live in Europe to secure my ability to live in Portugal. So I'm going to work towards Portuguese citizenship. Unlike the first guy, he's willing to learn the language and he'll just put in the time on the ground through Portugal's self-sufficient visa. So he and his family live there. They sign up for the NHR tax exemption. They're paying low five figures in tax. They top up a little bit on top of that to the U.S. And eventually, you know, he will get Portuguese citizenship by living there. So five years is the timeline before you can apply versus Italy's 10 years. He's like, okay, I'm willing to do that. Let's choose Portugal because it's faster and I don't have to do that. And then maybe he'll decide it's not worth that extra top of amount. If he loves the idea of living in Portugal, the family wants to stay there. Maybe he will no longer be American. His wife and young child can stay American. That's a decision he can make in the future. But he's making a little bit less money, has a more complicated structure, but he doesn't have to put out as much right now to get where he wants to go. But again, one jurisdiction to live, one jurisdiction for the company, and then one future citizenship will be coming in the first destination. Two different parts of the process. Had another gentleman wanted to live in Dubai. He is American. He wants out of the U.S. So, so far, three Americans. You're seeing that if you are American, you can still dramatically reduce your taxes by moving overseas, but you are going to have a bit more work to do, and you might have to pay a little bit to the U.S. This gentleman was making about a million and a half dollars a year in an online business, so he wants to live in Dubai. Now, you're not going to get citizenship in the UAE in terms that any Westerner probably wants to. They are giving citizenship to a small handful of very high-level people every year. But generally speaking, the UAE has not been a place, much like any tax haven, it's not been a place for naturalization. To the extent that they're starting to kind of roll that out, it would be no dual citizenship, learn Arabic. I mean, it's not something that if you're used to an American passport, you'd want to do, even though the UAE was number one on our Nomad Passport Index this year. So what he said was, hey, I want to live in Dubai. We went through and figured, hey, it makes sense. It's an easy story to understand that you're going to have your company in one of the free zones. That then in turn gets you residence. And then you want a citizenship because you want to get out of the U.S. And so therefore, we're just going to go and get a Caribbean citizenship. This brings up an interesting point of how good your passport should be. His thought is, you know what? I mostly want to stay in Dubai. I'm productive when I am just in one place. I'll travel a little bit. Maybe I'll go to Europe. If I fall in love with anywhere, I said, hey, we'll get a residence permit for you. If you decide, hey, oh, I love uh, Italy in the future, there'll be options for you to move to, to Italy if you want to live there. Maybe not a golden visa in the future, but certainly if you wanted to live there. So he said, hey, Caribbean citizenship to get me out of the US. I'm going to live in Dubai. I'm going to have my company in Dubai. Again, there's two pieces, but they're two different pieces. Him and the company are in the same place. But the citizenship is in a different place because he's not relying on where he lives for citizenship, but because the UAE is becoming so much more flexible and offering so many more options to help entrepreneurs and investors get residents on a longer term basis than ever before. He felt relatively confident that he's covered to stay living in the UAE, even though he's not a citizen there and he's merely on residence permits. And for when he needs to travel, the Caribbean passport gives him 80% of the strength that his U.S. passport did. And he says, that's quite enough for me as someone who's not always going to be on the go. One last person wanted to live in the Bahamas tried everything to talk them out of it. Our big boss here spent a year and a half in the Bahamas, found it to be very inefficient. A lot of people find Bahamas to be very inefficient. This couple actually just wanted a lifestyle. And what they ultimately had to do, even though they're entrepreneurs, is a lot of businesses in the Bahamas, you can't just set up a company and they won't necessarily qualify for residence. So they had to buy a house. They spent about a million dollars buying a house. And then they were able to incorporate their business elsewhere. I think they did theirs in, in Hong Kong, actually. They liked that for their kind of business. And so Bahamas tax policy was very friendly to towards that, right? Much more so than let's say Portugal. So they were able to live in the Bahamas. They were able to have residence in the Bahamas, not through the company, but through buying a property. So that's something that someone who didn't have a job, someone who's retired could do, but they did have a business. So they just set that up offshore and now they manage that offshore. So you can see here, most people have two or three different pieces of the puzzle. Here are the three pieces you want to look at. Where's the business incorporated? Where are you going to live? And I would add on to that, where do your employees live? Do you want them to be in one place, right? Dubai, the UAE gives you a bit more flexibility and bringing people in. The Cayman Islands does to some extent. You know, obviously within Europe, you can bring in people from other European countries if you incorporate in Ireland or Malta or wherever else. So business is number one. Where you live is number two. And number three is the citizenship. Not everyone necessarily needs a citizenship. I believe in these crazy times, having dual citizenship, if you're allowed to have it, is very beneficial. If you're not allowed to have it, have some kind of permanent residence that could flip into a citizenship at some point in the future, basically whenever you're ready for it. And so if you want to live in the UAE, the gentleman who wanted to live in Dubai, he was American. His issue for getting second citizenship was not being American. 
he said, listen, if I were Canadian, if I were Australian, if I were German, and I could just, you know, be done with the tax system in my country and move to Dubai and never leave, you know, I probably would just keep that passport. He said, yeah, I see your point that maybe in the future other countries are going to start taxing their citizens who live overseas, but it wouldn't be my top priority. He said, I want a simple life. I don't want to travel. I don't want to be filling out tax forms and filing this and that in a place I don't even live. So just, you know, get me a Caribbean passport. It's the easiest path to get out of the US tax system and live in Dubai. If you only wanted to live in Dubai, you may not need another passport, even if you don't have a great passport now. And so I think that you need the protection of dual or even triple citizenship these days, especially if you're an entrepreneur, especially if you're doing anything where you make a lot of money, it's innovative, it's controversial. You know, having more than one flag to pin on your on your lapel is a good idea. But you have to consider your travel needs. And so not every entrepreneur needs to rush. You see one guy here spending close to a million dollars on citizenship to secure his rights. Because again, business people don't want change. They don't want to be kicked out of somewhere. I don't think the UAE is rushing to kick out people who run businesses and employ people. I don't think most of these places are kicked them out because Italy, the UAE, Portugal, they've said, hey, please, we want you to come, hire people, bring your tax dollars, bring your spending dollars. But, you know, it is probably worth for most people investing in some kind of second citizenship, or at least as one gentleman here, just waiting and getting it eventually. So those are the three things to think about. Where's the business incorporated? Where do you want to live? Where's the citizenship? And very rarely do those three things match up. Look into those four case studies. Nomad capitalist help people just like that, just like you, move their business overseas, especially if you're an American, but really if you're from any Western country. Moving the existing business out takes more than just moving the assets to a new company. It's more complicated. How are you getting out of your country's tech system personally? How's your business getting out? Where are you going? How are you getting set up? What are the capital gains implications? You know, what are the employee implications? Where are your employees? If they're staying behind, how are you employing them? You know, where are you banking? Where are you living? What's your citizenship plan? We put together the suite of experts and act as your general contractor to make that happen because these case studies prove there's no such thing as I'm gonna move one place and that's all I need. There's always gonna be multiple countries in there. That's why it's called go where you're treated best, not move to another country.